Hi there, welcome back to my channel and today I'm going to be talking about the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock and I'm going to be ranking my top 10 Hitchcock films which is very difficult because there are so many great Hitchcock movies. I first discovered Hitchcock as a child and although I didn't know anything about auteur theory and film directors and film theory I just sensed watching Hitchcock that there was something different. The way they looked, the way they sounded, nothing in the world was like Hitchcock. Nothing that happened in reality was like Hitchcock. Nothing that happened in other movies was like Hitchcock. There was something like this was Hitchcock world. It was like this special Twilight Zone place that you went into when you watched a Hitchcock film. And I loved that feeling. So I've loved Hitchcock all my life. And ranking his films is very, very hard work. But at number 10, I'm going to start with The 39 Steps. It has to be The 39 Steps. And this is a good place to start because The 39 Steps is, in a way, the template for all of Hitchcock's filmography because he kept remaking it, didn't he? This idea of a guy, it was taken from the John Buchan novel with the you know, famous Richard Hannay character, this sort of suave, urbane, but independent individual who is, through a mistaken identity, finds himself in trouble with the police and the authorities and against some kind of secret organisation. And he replays this so many times in so many different movies, in Young and Innocent, Saboteur, and later in North by Northwest. It seems to be the story that he likes the most and that he went back to. And here, in his first iteration of it, he did it so well. This is a great movie. It never grows old. Um, Robert Donat and Madeleine Carroll have such chemistry together, that wonderful scene of course where he's got his handcuffs on and they have to get her stockings off and he rolls her hand down his leg, all that sort of stuff, it's great fun, there's an there's a action on a train which is always good fun and you know I love Mr Memory, one of my favourite things in Hitchcock is Mr Memory, am I right sir? Great ending to the film. Um, it's just a fantastic caper movie, the, probably the best caper movie ever made. Although, we'll come to another film like it later on in this, in this list. But uh, it never loses its charm for me, and this has been one of my favourite films for the longest time. But at number nine, I'm going to put another English classic, The Lady Vanishes. This is the perfect movie for a day like this. Cold November day outside, inside, lights on, fire on, watching a nice comfort movie... You cannot do better than The Lady Vanishes. You know, again, wonderful cast, Margaret Lockwood and Sir Michael Redgrave, who are great together as this young couple who realise that this uh, governess, this kind of frumpy governess, has gone missing on a train and no one will admit that they've ever seen her or know about her. And there's this wonderful uh, pair of uh, cricket fans, Charters, Charters and Caldecott, who became um, a famous duo after this movie. Um, wonderful character actors and all they want to do is get home for the test match <laughs> they don't care what's happened to this woman or what's happening on board this train they just want to get home for the test match uh, they're great characters the whole movie has got a really light quality but genuinely suspenseful quality as well so those are my two favourite English Hitchcocks um, I've really picked American films after this um, it's funny to think, you know, back in the 1940s, a lot of people thought Hitchcock had, you know, sold out going to America. And they thought his best pictures were in Britain. There was a sort of a slight snobbishness about it. Nowadays, after the French critics praised his American work, who would say that? You know, people think of Hitchcock as an American director. And the English period is mostly forgotten or not watched, which is rather sad, I think. I love the English period, but I must admit, I think the films of the American period are more expansive and more exciting. My eighth place on this list is Psycho. Now, some people would play this, place this at number one or number two. I'm placing it at number eight. The truth of the matter is that even though I'm a horror fan, for me, Psycho is two films. The first 45 minutes with Marion Crane and Janet Lee stealing the money in the car, the camera on those haunted eyes of her, getting to the motel, meeting Anthony Perkins, the shower scene, and then, you know, Anthony Perkins discovering her and cleaning up after her, putting her car in the swamp. If the movie ended there and said the end, it would probably be my favourite Hitchcock film. I think it's some of the best work he ever did. But the movie keeps going, and the movie after that I don't find as interesting. In fact, I find it quite ordinary. You know, it has those famous set pieces with Martin Balsam falling down the stairs and 
discovering the skeleton of the woman in the cellar and all that sort of stuff. But I have to be honest, I found the film a bit of a bore after that. It's the first 45 minutes which I think are really special and really, really superb. Some of the best filmmaking Hitchcock ever did. So it's a film of two halves for me, and that's why it comes at eighth in the list. At seventh in the list is Marnie. Now, this was a film which, was when I was young, didn't really interest me. But as I've grown older, I've become more and more interested in it. This is the one where Tippi Hedren plays a, a kleptomaniac. She's this beautiful young woman, but she has this past. And every time, you know, she, she sees red and the colour red soaks the screen. And she faints and you don't know why. And she's given to theft. And this psychiatrist, uh, played by Sean Connery, becomes interested in her case. And it's probably the last of Hitchcock's truly great films. I like some of uh, the sequences and set pieces in some of his later films. In fact, in two of his later films are two of the best set pieces in Hitchcock's work. I'm thinking of that fantastic scene in Topaz, where Natalie Wood gets shot and she, as she falls down and you're looking from above and her dress billows out like a bloodstain. Absolutely amazing. The film is a bit dull, but that is an extraordinary sequence. And in Frenzy, that amazing moment where the girl goes into the murderer's flat and you know she's being killed and the camera just backs down the stairs, down, down and out the doorway into the busy crowded street. I think probably my favourite single sequence in Hitchcock. I don't much care for the movie overall, but that is an amazing sequence. So Marnie is my last of the great uh, Hitchcock films. And what fascinates me about Marnie I'm not so interested in the sort of psychosexual, you know, bit and the relationship between her and Connery and that rather awkward bit where Connery seems to rape her, which is a bit uncomfortable. I'm not so much interested in that. What I'm interested in is the Englishness of Marnie. This is an American film, nominally set in America, but it's so obviously based on an English novel. I mean, it has fox hunting in it, for God's sake. The last sequence where they go to see the mother looks like it's shot in Newcastle. In fact, I'm sure it's based on a famous photograph of the docks in Newcastle, though I might be wrong about that. The whole film has a very English feel. It's sort of the sort of frigidity around the whole issue of sex, because uh, Tippi Hendren's character has a kind of frigidity around it. It feels English rather than American, right? I mean, the whole film, you can clearly see it's English, and Hitchcock doesn't even try to hide it. And one of the things that fascinates me about Hitchcock is his... Englishness and how that Englishness never left him all the way through his American career. And it interests me that the French critics of the Nouveau Vague saw Hitchcock as an American director. They hated British cinema and they saw Hitchcock as this American director. Yet his Englishness is evident in almost everything he does. It's, it's like a, a, a skein running through his work. And that's one of the things that interests me about Marnie. I find it a fascinating film. At number six, uh, a bit of an unusual choice a film that many people think is one of the lesser Hitchcocks, and picking Rope. Now, like Marnie, this is based on English source material, a play by Patrick Hamilton, one of my favourite writers. And it's about two... In the original play, it's about two overtly gay men, although they, they sort of quieten down the homosexuality aspect in the film, who murder another person and put them in a tea chest and then hold a party in their flat. And one of their professors becomes more and more suspicious. Now, Hitchcock took this quite simple material, one set play, and he used it to do an experiment. He wanted to try and get as close as you could in those days to a one-take film, right? Now, in those days, the loader in the camera, the reel you got, was 10 minutes maximum, right? So what he did was a a sequence of 10-minute shots, And each time there was an edit, he would go behind someone's back or behind a bit of furniture to make it look like one single continuous take. It was an experimental film, and many critics and audiences thought the experiment was a failure. Um, I don't think it's a failure. I think it's a very interesting and compelling film. But what really interests me about Rope is not so much the story and not so much Hitchcock's experiment, It's what it tells us about Hitchcock as a director. Now, the British critic Gilbert Adair wrote this book for the centenary of cinema, Flickers. It's very good if you've never read it. And what he does is he takes a still 
from each year of cinema's history. And then he writes a little essay on that still. And this is the essay he writes about Hitchcock. And to illustrate Hitchcock, he chooses a still from Rope. And there it is. And what you'll notice about that is there's no actors in it. It's, there's no scene from the movie in it. It's just a set. And this is what he writes. In the image opposite, clearly, the film is not yet underway. The room in which it is set is empty. But Hitchcock himself is present, already there, eerily so. I love that eerily so. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the way that in just a standing set, the way it's lit, the way it's shot, Hitchcock is there. And that's what interests me about this movie, this experimental adaptation of a play. It's, it just is suffused with Hitchcock. I also love James Stewart's performance as the professor who has this growing sense of dread about what is really going on there. It's beautifully played by Stewart. But that's what really fascinates me about Rope. It's not so much the experiment with a single shot, though that is very interesting and very well done. It's the fact that this simple material taken by Hitchcock becomes something else. And that's what really fascinates me about Hitchcock's work in general. And I think this film is probably the best example of it. So now we get to our top five. These are the real creme de la creme of Hitchcock. And at number five is a film that I grow more and more in love with every year. And that is North by Northwest. When I first saw this as a teenager, I didn't really like it that much. I loved it up until he meets Eva Marie Saint on the train, right? And then I felt it sort of became just a series of set pieces with rather poor process shots. Um, you know, I was a bit picky. But later on, um, I watched this film, and now I've watched it dozens of times. I, I go back to it all the time, and I love it more and more. There was a French critic at the time, whose name I forget, who said that this was the apogee of cinema. And I'm starting to see what they mean. This is the ultimate iteration of The 39 Steps, which I was talking about before. This is where... Hitchcock gets to make it on a grand scale across the whole length of America from Mount Rushmore to the, you know, the Dust Bowl. You know, he really, you know, takes it on a massive scale and he, he perfects it. He's got the perfect actor in Cary Grant. He has the perfect villain in James Mason with good support from Martin Landau. And every single set piece is fun from the crop duster sequence, the Mount Rushmore sequence, the wonderful auction sequence, which is very funny and tense. It's just fantastic. It's so funny. You know, the, the character is called Roger O. Thornhill and the O doesn't stand for anything because he's just this kind of vacuous advertising executive. There's the lovely little scene, the charming scene in the train station, Jen's toilets, when he's trying to shave with this tiny little razor. It's just a gloriously fun film. I think I was a bit uptight about it when I was a teenager, a bit serious. But if you just relax, this is, this is Hitchcock in cruise control. It's so beautiful, you know. I mean, and the sets are gorgeous. That wonderful set of the cafe underneath Mount Rushmore, just, just to get that scene with the stabbing. I mean, and also, this movie is the best example of the way that Hitchcock, he was not just telling stories of suspense. He was a much better artist than that, you know. And he was really interested in modernism and the avant-garde. And this movie shows it beautifully. That opening title sequence, I cannot get past that opening title sequence. These lines of stress coming down and the music dum da da dum da dum da dum dum da dum dum and this these lines intersecting and it's you know like a sort of a headache, a stress point, a critical mass. Then you find out it's the lines of a building, a skyscraper, and then you get into this incredible sequence of these people frantically Crazy, they're like bees swarming around underground stations and buses. The chaos of life, which this, you know, character is going to be plunged into. And that sort of, that use of sort of abstract avant-garde patterns goes throughout the movies. There's that fantastic shot from above when Cary Grant runs out of the UN building. And it's like a sort of, like a sort of 1930s modernist painting with blocks of colour and lines and geometry. Beautiful. Anyway, I could talk about this film all day. It's just wonderful. Now, at number four is another film that I think is very neglected in Hitchcock's oeuvre, and that is Notorious. 
This was made in 46 with an extraordinary cast, Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman and Claude Rains all at their best. And it's Hitchcock's darkest and most adult film. Uh, the storyline is Ingrid Bergman is the daughter of a convicted Nazi spy and the FBI use her to get close to Claude Rains, effectively prostitute her. And this is very clear in the film. And Cary Grant is falling in love with her, but he has to watch as she prostitutes herself to this Claude Rains character. So it's a very twisted film. The acting is extraordinary, the script is superb. It has the amazing key sequence. If you know that sequence with the key in Ingrid Bergman's hand, if you don't know the sequence, watch the film. It's one of Hitchcock's great set-piece moments. It's beautiful. Um, I always feel sorry for Claude Rains at the end, even though he's a bastard. I always feel sorry for him as he walks out on, on, the, on that uh, steps down to that car. Um, I think this is a great, great film. Some of the best acting in Hitchcock's cinema and some of the darkest, most adult undercurrents in his films. Now, talking of undercurrents, we have to come to the third film on this list, which is The Birds. The first Hitchcock film that I really fell in love with. And it's a film I go back to periodically, and I never tire of it. It's a film based on a, a Daphne du Maurier story, and it's often characterised as a horror film, with these birds going crazy and um, setting on the inhabitants of this North California town. But if you watch The Birds, um, it's not really a horror film. Or rather, it's a psychological horror film. It's really a curious movie where someone's soul is exposed to the light. Because the soul in this case is Tippi Hendren's character, this sort of socialite, this sort of rather glib airhead from the city who comes to this small town and causes trouble because she's in love with this guy but this guy is jealously uh, held onto by his mother, and there's another woman who likes him in the, in the town. And this swirl of jealous undercurrents is actually kind of, it's, a, you know, it, it's made real, it's made visible in the attack of the birds. And this is what disconcerted me as a young person, this idea that actually the sort of thematic elements were coming to light in physical terror, in physical carnage. And the carnage is, is very real. You know, there's that incredible sequence where um, the mother, Jessica Tandy, goes to this house and finds this man dead and you get that dum, 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 close up on the man's, you know, pecked out eyes. And I love the sequence um, in the cafe where the birds have started attacking and Tippi Hendren comes in and she goes around the corner and everyone's staring at her as if she is at fault. And then the birds really start attacking. And there's that wonderful sequence which looks, I suppose, slightly silly to modern eyes, but I think it's very well done, where Hedron, you know, she's watching what's going on and there's a, a gas line, a, a line of petrol and it's catching a light and she watches it like that. And then you cut, then you, you see it like that, then you cut, then you see it like that. The whole film is about what's going on in her head, her journey towards a kind of insanity. And that's why that sequence is so brilliant. It may seem a bit sort of far-fetched and a bit mannered, but it's just so brilliant. And the sequence where the two women who love the Rod Taylor character chat is so beautifully acted and so beautifully, uh, you know, choreographed. It's a film that gets richer and richer the more I watch it. One little tip for those people who've seen the film and think they know it quite well. I had to have this pointed out to me in a film course, Hitchcock's brilliant use of sound. Oh my God, I could not believe it when I saw it. You know the famous scene where she's sitting outside the school and she's smoking? And what she doesn't realise is behind her, the birds are gathering on the climbing frame one by one, and then she turns around and like, they're all there, right? Watch it again. Every time she takes a puff on her cigarette and blows out, you hear a breath of wind on the soundtrack. It's very deliberate and it's there. And it's it, all the way through, it's because Hitchcock is not just a clever meta of sen, right? He's not just a clever, you know, physical director. He's thinking about the thematics of his film. He's a very intelligent director. And in this film, Tippi Hendren is a problem. She's come to this town and she's a disruption. So everything she does 
both as a character and in the way the film works, is a disruption. So they have a breath of wind, right? It's not deadly quiet as it seems to be. You actually just hear her wind. You know, she's noisy. She causes noise and disruption. Brilliant. I was amazed when that was pointed out to me. But it's there. And that's the sort of thing you see throughout the birds. I won't, I'll stop talking about this film now. I could talk about it all day. Second place is a film that really defies uh, discussion because it's just so perfect. I think it's as close to perfect as Hollywood ever got. And that is Rear Window. And Rear Window is a gift, isn't it? To film students and film lecturers everywhere. Look, the art of looking. A man looking at his through his back window like a cinema screen. Yes, and he can choose what he looks at. Yes. Oh my God, the amount of crap that is talked about this film in film lectures. But you know what? It's all true. It's brilliant. This movie is just... I cannot think of a single thing wrong with it. And again, it's a movie that you discover all sorts of little layers and beautiful moments. The little red of Raymond Burr's cigarette as he sits in the dark. The way that Grace Kelly seems to loom over James Stewart because for some reason James Stewart doesn't want to marry Grace Kelly and she looms over him in a sort of sexual predator way. There's so many levels, you know, Mrs. Lonely Hearts, The Dancer, Hitchcock doing his little cameo in the room with the piano. I think there's no better film made about urban living, no better film made about the art of looking and the need to look you know, the sort of peeping Tom. No better film made about cinema. I don't really have anything else to say about it. it it's just so good, it defies any kind of discussion. So, number one, I'm going to be a bit boring and be conventional, I'm going to pick Vertigo. I, this film never leaves me, it haunts me, and is one of my favourite films of all time. Now, we could talk about James Stewart's brilliant performance, we could talk about the extraordinary cinematography of San Francisco. We could talk about Bernard Herrmann's score, which so brilliantly taps into the themes of the film. It's an extraordinary score. We could talk about the casting of Kim Novak, which was inspired. But none of that would get to what I really love about this film. Going back to what I was saying about the birds, it's about the bringing of a soul to light. You know, Vertigo is a very odd movie. And let's not forget that for many years... Very few people watched it. It was kind of one of the lost Hitchcocks. It was very unpopular. It wasn't a conventional, sort of light-hearted thriller as Hitchcock usually did. It's a kind of weird, twisted film about this guy sort of pursuing this woman around San Francisco and falling in love with her, even though she's supposed to be the reincarnation of a dead woman. I mean, what the fuck? You know, I mean, it's a twisted plot. You know, it's weird, right? So what is it about this film that I particularly like? Like... The birds, it's the bringing of a soul to light, right? And it's a film about embarrassment, a very rare subject in film, or indeed in any art form. It's about the real interior life of a man, James Stewart Scotty, brought in front of everybody's eyes so that his obsession with this woman, which was actually manufactured by his friend, right? becomes obvious to everyone. So there's that awful scene after she dies the first time and he's in that tribunal and he's exposed, his, his ludicrousness and his helplessness is exposed before everybody. And that's a kind of metaphor for what the movie is doing. We are looking into his soul, not just in that dream sequence, but the whole movie is a map of his soul. He's exposed before us. And that's why that scene when the Barbara Bel Geddes character is drawing her and she gives her her face so disgusted Scotty, and we understand. We understand that that is kind of repugnant, because Hitchcock has brought us so much into Scotty's universe and his way of looking. I think that's what I find so compelling and haunting about this film. I don't care about the mechanics of the plot. I don't care that the ending is a bit far-fetched and a bit over the top. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is the way it brings us into one man's mind and exposes it to light. That extraordinary sequence when he's kissing her and the camera rotates, right? They're still and the, the scene is rotating around them and suddenly they're back in that mission. You know, that's what the whole film is doing. And I think it does it beautifully and hauntingly. 
And I think it is Hitchcock's most haunting and resonant and fascinating and complex work. And that's why I'm putting it at number one. I'm sorry if I've missed out any favourites. I mean, I would love to have found a place for Young and Innocent. I would love to have found a place for Foreign Correspondent and Lifeboat, two propaganda films from the Second World War, which are hugely underrated. I haven't found a place for Strangers on a Train, which is great fun. I also, worst of all, haven't found a place for The Wrong Man with Henry Fonda, which I think is a, a real masterpiece. So I'm sorry about that, but these are my 10 Hitchcock films. Let me know what yours are below, and please like and subscribe if you like this content. Thank you.